Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to chapel on this October 1st, uh, Thursday. Um, Chuck had suggested some passages, that's Reverend Tedrick, um, uh, with regards to but Jesus or but God types of transitions in scripture. One of them he suggested was Jonah, and uh, I couldn't help but want to revisit one of the greatest short stories ever um, written. So if you turn with me, this morning our meditation will come from Jonah chapter 4. And I think I'll pick up, well, we'll read the whole chapter. It's uh, short. Actually, uh, the whole book is short. It takes less than seven minutes to read out loud um, in English. And um, so I'll pick up at verse 1 and then uh, read through verse 11. <clears throat> but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city, and he made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade for his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pitied the plant for which you did not labor, and nor did you make it grow, which came up into being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Thus, the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, we do pray and plead with you once again that in this short meditation and this respite from our regular studies, uh, that you would reveal yourself to us, that you would grant that posture without which no one can understand your truth, especially from your word, namely that we might have reverence and humility before it. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen. John Calvin once said, Hence no one will be a willing prophet or teacher except he is persuaded that God is merciful. Uh, he wrote that in his comments on uh, Jonah. Um, as many of you know, um, this was my first publishing project. I wrote a book on Jonah. It was a hard book to write. Um, as Flannery O'Connor says, Writing a book is like giving birth to a piano sideways. Um, that's true. She said that. And they let me put it in print in another book, so I figured I could mention it in chapel, too. Um, but Jonah is a uh, great short story, perhaps one of the uh, best short stories ever written. Um, I wrote this chapter on chapter 4 in a disaster, a storm, a personal one and a real one. Uh, not a pandemic, but a different kind of disaster. My parents had offered some timeshare down in Williamsburg, and a hurricane had swept through there. And I called the place before I went down there to work on this sabbatical and said, uh, is it okay to show up? And they said, oh, yeah, come on down. Well, there is no electricity. And I was the only one at this huge place. But I bought a bunch of candles and then went to Starbucks during the day to recharge my computer and then just work by candlelight. And it was, it was actually quite delightful. 
Um, but it was there that um, I began to understand chapter 4 of Jonah, uh, one of the most sublime chapters, I think, in the Hebrew Bible. And um, other people have understood in the past that Jonah is a sublime book, even though it's very short. In fact, a lot of the work that's going on in canonical studies on the book of the 12, the minor prophets, in other words, reading them with different set of questions than we often ask around here, like, why are these books in the order that they are? And uh, why were they bequeathed to us in the Tanakh, the Hebrew order of the uh, Hebrew Bible, uh, in the way that they are? And asking those kinds of questions gives you a whole different set of answers. Some people think Jonah might have been the hermeneutical key to actually, for the ancients, to reading the Book of the Twelve, interestingly enough. Uh, but my main point, very simply, uh, so we can stick on one point, uh, main point, is that um, uh, I think Jonah, the book of Jonah here, is teaching us that our compassion and mercy often uh, falls far uh, short of God's. Uh, but his mercy and compassion is vastly uh, different. And realizing the Lord's compassion and love towards others can lift us out of ourselves. Uh, right now, we're living in extraordinary, unprecedented times. And I think if we can get our arms wrapped around the message here in Jonah, it might prepare us to talk with one another on campus, talk to one another um, off of campus, perhaps in the community or in our own place of residence, but also as the Lord gives us opportunity uh, to share uh, with others uh, during these extraordinary times. So let's jump in and look at a little bit of the exegesis of this passage. I remember seeing a marquee not long before I was working on this. It said, anger is one letter away from danger. And isn't that true? Um, Steve Boz here, so I'll mention a, uh, a fond memory an older uh, mother in the Lord, a matriarch of the church where we both used to attend, Betty Speck. And when I turn, returned to Eugene to do my own internship, kind of where you all are right now, and Alfred Poirier was kind enough to step down the entire summer and give me the pulpit. I think he just wanted to study and write himself. But anyway, um, so, um, I can remember Betty coming up to me afterwards and saying, perhaps this applies to some of you too, I don't know, but says, Brian, slow down, first of all. You talk way too fast. I was nervous. But then also, are you angry? He said, you, 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 you exhort like you're angry. And I think I um, had this if you will, I'm groping for words, this overinflated sense of the gravity of what I was doing. Obviously, this is serious when one mounts the pulpit and exhorts the people of God. Um, but I think I had let that concern for not running roughshod over God's holiness to get too much inside my head, and the people were picking up that I was angry. Um, and frankly, candidly, I've noticed that a lot about students early on. So I guess I was one of them, and maybe you fall prey to that or have fallen prey to that too. Um, that um, it's not just what we say up here. It's also how we say it, right, and how we communicate it. Um, Jonah, in this passage, seems to have forgotten God's mercy to him early on. And uh, I think as one author says, a Jewish author, Simone, who wrote a great little commentary on this book, said, the Lord utterly repudiate his, that is Jonah's basic premise, that mercy must not be intermingled with justice. It is an error that cannot be eradicated from his heart by additional information, but only by personal experience that will open his eyes to a clearer perception of himself other human beings, and his God, close quote. You see, it struck me when I was working on this that um, God is the quintessential counselor. <laughs> it's the job of professional counselors and pastors um, to a certain degree. Uh, they know, must know their limits, too, and when they're not competent to counsel, 
um, but to reframe people's thinking and to create a context that helps people think differently about their suffering, uh, differently about the questions that are driving them crazy, uh, differently about the feelings they may be experiencing, to quote the poet, because the slings and darts of an outrageous fortune have slammed upon their head. And what I see here at the end is God dragging uh, Jonah out to his own schoolhouse in order to instruct him and creating a different context and asking questions, telling him a parable so he might um, uh, get out of his own mind a little bit in order to reframe his uh, way of thinking. And the questions are really, in this section, the key to understanding, I think, the end of the book. There's only one other book in the Bible that ends in a question. It's another prophet. And then this book as well. But there's several questions that are um, asked here. You notice in verse 4, have you a right to be angry? And so uh, God asks him this question and leaves it hanging in the air. And then he sends a hot east wind. This hot east wind is exactly identical that we're experiencing right now with what they experience over in the Middle East and um, that Jonah would have been experiencing. In other words, the climatological conditions are exactly the same. Uh, Arabic kamsim, um, Hebrew sa'arav, uh, that's the equivalent of our shirako. And the winds shift, typically westerly, they shift to the east, they bring hot east winds, which destroys our flowers out in our garden and dries things up and causes firestorms and great upheavals of destruction. Um, but, interestingly, the Hebrews often represented God as appearing in this very way. So it's by no accident that this hot east wind comes and that God's theophany, manifestation of himself, occurs almost coincidental, if you will, with this hot east wind. And then in verse 9, uh, God asks Jonah another question about the kikayon, that is, this plant that has come up. Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And then, you know, he goes on and says, uh, you didn't birth this thing. You didn't even water. You didn't cause it to grow. And yet you're so angry as you sit there in your attitude of schadenfreude, you know, malicious pleasure in somebody else's um, um, injurious outcome. The Germans say it in one word. It takes us about a sentence or two to describe it. And there he sits, waiting. You know, verse 4, it, it displeased Johnny. Well, well what's it? <laughs> the it, yeah, it refers to God's having compassion and, and uh, pity upon the Ninevites. That's what displeased him. And so he waits, sulking. And God sends his hot east wind. And then uh, the worm destroys uh, the plant. And then God asks this profound question. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left? And a whole bunch of cattle as well. <laughs> um, you can find people all over the map trying to understand this enigmatic last phrase. Um, I think that I have plumbed the depths of the Holy Spirit's intention here, um, to quote Calvin. Uh, and, um, and I think it has to do with studying the language, frankly. So he says, uh, uh, may I not have pity? And he uses a word here a couple times, chus. And uh, it's first common singular, so it's a chus. May I not have pity? Uh, upon these people. Now, what is chus? Well, chus relates to superiors who are in a position to either give a thumbs up or a thumbs down with regards to their subjugated uh, people who are under their ju jurisdiction. And so he says, don't I have the right, basically? Don't I have the right to exercise pity and compassion on these people uh, who... Uh, don't know their right hand from their left hand. I'll read you a very short quote from George Landis, I think, who nails it here. He says, 
He does not object, that is Jonah, to the divine compassion and salvation directed to those like himself, but when it is also effective for the wicked, he cannot abide it. Yet he is unwilling to live without his old belief, and because he refuses to let Yahweh transform his anger into love and his pity for plants into pity for people, his conception of what the object of divine mercy ought to be and to what Yahweh has shown him it actually is, then he desperately longs to die. Um, I probably mentioned psychology too much already in this little chapel, chapel devotion, but perhaps his depression here is his anger turning in on himself, which we know, uh, and DSM knows, is a cause of chronic depression. Um, so he says, do I not have a right to exercise pity? The idiom here, yada ben le, to distinguish between, to know between two things, has to do with discrimination. Um, basically what he's saying here about the people who don't know the right hand from their left is they have no discrimination. They have no discernment. Uh, to cut right to the quick, they're so caught up and entrapped in their besetting sins. They can't even crawl out of the hole they've created for themselves. And all those with you pastoral experience, some of you in the room, I can see you shaking your head. Oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about a room where you're, where you're with someone who's so trapped. And sin is so thick in the air, it's like you could cut it with a knife. And you can feel it. And they have no power in and of themselves to crawl out that hole. Jonah, don't I have a right to pity these kind of creatures? Impliedly, how dare you put me in the dock? Don't I have a right to exercise compassion towards them? makes a very easy segue to the New Testament, not to jump there too, too quickly, but when we see the Son of God do exactly the same thing. When he looks out over Jerusalem, those to whom he came in his own didn't even recognize him. And he says, oh, how I longed to gather you as a mother hen under my wings. And yet you were unwilling. People of God, we live in extraordinary times. You have much opportunity to communicate and to show deeds of kindness and love and pity and compassion, not only in what you say, but the very tone <laughs> with which you say it and with which you engage others. And that will continue. The wake of this thing, even after the vaccine, will continue for years as will the spiritual, emotional, physical, economic problems that have also come in its wake. You know, often students, when they're getting ready to leave or they're going off their summer internship to close things on a note, um, uh, they say, hey, can we go do lunch? And then they ask, hey, what, what books should I read this summer? First year out of seminary. Now I have some time to really read what I want to read. What's the latest, greatest biblical theology professor still? I usually tell them to read novels and fiction instead. It'll make them better preachers. So they want to go, do you have any last minute advice? And this isn't the classical liberal line, <laughs> just be like Jesus and love people, but love your people. That they will never forget. They will forget what you said on the previous Sunday. <laughs> they're still nourished by it. And you can remind the person who criticizes your sermon on Sunday out in the foyer. You can say, did your wife feed you last week? Yes. Do you remember what she said? No. Were you nourished by it? Yes. And then just that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> no, seriously. People will remember when you had compassion on them and when you have pity on them, and when you show them face to face, heart to heart, the mercy of God. 
Let's pray. Father, um, we pray that you would uh, make us more like yourself, help us to slay our own sins of anger and uh, our longing for justice um, at the expense of mercy. Father, help us to slay our harshness. Help us to slay our um, direct speech uh, when we just need to listen or show compassion. Uh, Father, we thank you for this passage. We pray that even in these few moments this morning that you would indelibly uh, write these lessons upon our hearts and call them to mind uh, so we may be better servants of your word as you give us opportunity either now or in the next days or months, and especially in the years to come, as you call us, uh, some of us, to that most holy office. Uh, we ask this all for Jesus' namesake. Amen. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.